definitely all set up for rockabilly now. So yeah, let, well, let me hear some rockabilly. Uh, I mean, rockabilly. Sure. Um, some some slap, pop, or whatever it's called. <laughs> Just slap. Not much popping, although I guess it's almost like a pop the way you're doing it. Uh, what do I want to do? Um, I mean, a lot of it's just serve. Oh man, that was, that was wonderful. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Shad, Eric Harris on the bass here, uh, doing an interview for Detroit bass players, one of our Detroit bass players. And uh, man, what is that you was just doing? Uh, that slap thing. How, how did you do that with that with your right hand? How did, oh, what's, what's uh, going on? You know, uh, it literally is uh, aggressive and, and hitting it a lot. <laughs> I mean, you pull it off. Yeah, I mean you're kind of pulling it out a little bit here. I mean there are a lot of cats out there with even better technique than I do. I'm, I'm actually fairly new to this compared to some of the other stuff I do, but it's uh, give it a nice good yank like that. I mean it doesn't really require it's just like with really good slap technique uh, where you're playing like more of a funk sound on electric. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of effort to get the right sound out of it, but uh, it does require some actual physicality to it nonetheless. I mean, being an upright, it's a more physical instrument in the first place. Okay, good. Well, welcome uh, to Detroit Bass Player. Another interview, and uh, also in the house today we got with us Mr. Sean May. How you doing? Good, how are you? All right. Say Jane, everyone. <laughs> the other Sean. The other. Not a, like the Irish in me. <laughs> and then we got Reggie around here somewhere. Of course, you got me, big guy. So, uh, Man, I like to, I like to start asking questions like, um, let's see, when did you start playing bass, and and do you just play upright, or did you play the regular bass guitar too, electric? And yeah, um, I I play uh, bass guitar and upright. Um, I I started off on bass guitar uh, when I was about 15, uh, because about 14 I decided uh, I wanted to be a rock star. Mm -hmm. And about 15 is when I realized I couldn't sing good enough to uh, to pull it off, so I better learn how to play something uh, on the recommendation from my brother, who's a, a drummer as well. And uh, and so I thought, my brother told me, man, you should play bass. Bass is easy. You know, you could sing and play bass and be in a band. It'll be cool. And uh, and I immediately started learning how to play stuff by Rush. So uh, Get <laughs> with Getty Lee, the bass player, right? Now was that just the electric bass or the upright as well? Uh, that was electric. I, I didn't start an upright until um, I actually bought my first upright when I was a senior from my geometry teacher in Northville. And uh, he had this old bass that he'd been playing bluegrass on and had just decided to sell it. And it it had three strings on it. Uh, they were all nylon. It was really beat up and I got it. And I started playing it and I tell you what, man, it had enough problems. It was almost harder to play than it was worth. Um, but I used that bass for a couple of years, and about that time, or shortly thereafter, I started at Wayne State as a bass major uh, in jazz studies program. And so when I did that, um, I, I mean, you could, you can kind of be an electric bassist in the jazz program, but it's really encouraged that you're playing upright more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anything I can do on an upright, I can apply a lot of the same concepts to the electric, especially when you're talking about notes and just walking lines and stuff. I can do that anywhere. So, um, so I, I really focused on upright at that time, but, I mean, I was still playing in bands and stuff like that, and I did a lot of electric, too. So, kind of mixed a, a, a bunch of both. And um, so it's really worked out well for me. I, I like playing both instruments. They both have their place. Uh, each has a certain calling, and I like to like to go with it when it's called on. Mm, good, good, good. Um, well, you mentioned one of the first things you learned was some uh, Rush with Getty Lee on bass. Uh, yeah. Well, who are some of your favorite bass players uh, growing up and and to this day? 
Wow. Um, some of my favorite... Upright and electric. Upright and electric. Okay. Um, you know, it's really funny. A lot... For upright... I mean, John Patitucci and Ron Carter and, you know, some, some of the... Ron Carter, another Detroit bass player. He's all right, man. Who else? Uh, and, and James Jamerson, man, because, of course, he, I mean, he got famous for the stuff he did on that Fender, but he was an upright player, you know? And, I mean, that's where the whole hook thing came from, from right. this. You know, if you look at, uh, we mentioned Dan Polisco a minute ago, if you find some old pictures of Dan, you'll see his one finger, just the one finger, is all taped up. And that was because when he was young, he was playing so much that his finger was all chewed up and the only way he could actually keep it bandaged mm -hmm. was this huge wad of bandage mm -hmm. on it but it's just the one finger because I mean a lot of times when you're playing upright I mean I I use two fingers sometimes but it, about 85% of what I do is with one finger yeah. mm -hmm. so but anyway that's uh he got that from playing upright and um so those are, are some guys I really like um How about electric Electric. Oh wait, there's one other cat I want to mention on Upright too, uh, which is Brian Bromberg. I've actually stolen a lot of stuff from Brian Bromberg. One of my favorite upright yeah, right bases as well. Uh, I can't really do that well when it's set up for rockabilly. <laughs> That's yeah. ow. Um, so that and for electric, um, you know, early on, of course, Getty Lee was a huge influence on me. Um, uh, Cliff Burton from Metallica, of course. Uh, I was kind of kind of a hard rocker in, in my early youth, and uh, but quickly got out of that. And then these days, uh, like Ricard Bona, I love, uh, of course Jocko, of course Jocko. Uh, Victor Wooten is a huge. Uh, I steal tons from Victor Wooten. Um, I remember I went through a Kim Stone phase where I was really into <laughs> the stuff he was doing. Uh, but, but I mean, there's there's so many great bassists out there. It's, it's hard for me to like narrow it down and say these are the cats who really, really, really blow my mind more than anyone else. Because every time I think I'm kind of there, then you know, Tal Wilkenfield comes out or right. Esperanza Spalding, oh, or yeah, you know, yeah, someone yeah. else will come out and and again, my mind is really blown <laughs> and I look at my bass like a coffee table for a few days and then get back to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, uh, guess what else? Uh, we got Reggie. And then, in case you heard a little bass in the background, it's okay. Reggie mm -hmm. playing on the F bass. Uh, yeah, this good. F bass, so who's the bass is that? Oh, that's that's mine. That's Sean's okay. six string fretless F bass. Uh, sounds good from over here. Yeah, it sounds really nice. Maybe we plug it in a little bit, man, uh, on your what I like to call a play us out section. Yeah. Oh, there you go. So, so you started when you was 15. You started playing. When, did you? When did you start socializing with other musicians and getting together and jamming? Did you jam or did you get out on a tour? Uh, what, uh, how wow. did you get? How did you start enjoying and blaze and, well, and to still keep playing it? Um, I remember my first my first gig with a band was actually the same day I graduated from high school, so a little later than some guys jamming around. Uh, but I I got into a band with a few cats uh, who were Wait, all on. older than me. The same day you graduated day. from I actually, high school? I went to my graduation commencement, uh -huh. and then I went to the uh, my gig, which, <laughs> as as might be true for a lot of people, my first gig with a fairly new band, it was terrible. And That's pretty cool, though. And then it was cool. And then I went to my senior all-night party and slept for about an hour, and then I went and took my SATs. Wow. <laughs> That's so the, good. It was, uh, and I fell asleep during my SATs, uh, but luckily I managed to pull off a pretty good score on them anyway, and uh, and Wayne State let me <laughs> let me participate. <laughs> good. So, so what have you been doing since uh, graduation on these five bases that you have with us here? Uh, well, see here, you, you know, uh, I got in for a while there my main thing is I was one of the leaders of an 11 piece funk group called Trip Horn Solution which was kind of tower power meets Ohio players uh, and that was a lot of fun man and we you know I got to dig in and do some really fun bass work with bands like that um, any clips of this stuff? You got any on? Uh, Maybe not, man, because well, it was before everybody had a camera on everything, you know. Right. So, right. Uh, so uh, there, there might be some. If you go on to like iTunes and stuff like that, you can actually find. I mean, we're still for sale. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you find trip horn, trip horn is one word but two p's. I mean, I was young enough that I still liked misspelling everything. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, uh, but that that was a uh, it was supposed to be a play on words of trip hop, but everyone thought it meant triple horn, whatever. Uh, and that was really cool. And you know, we got to dabble with a little bit of Latin music, and uh, we'd even throw in like some Caribbean and ska and fun stuff in there like that. It was cool. Um, a lot of jazz, uh, a lot of things where I'm just filling in with people, subbing, jam sessions, late night stuff. Uh, Throw some names out there, bands, if you can remember. Don, I, I loved going to catch Don Mayberry over at Baker's yeah. on Wednesday nights um, with Harris and all those guys over there. Man, and uh, I, I had a lot of fun. I, I met uh, Johnny O'Neill over there, and I did a little stint where every chance I got, I would uh, jam with Johnny O'Neill, and that was so much fun, man. What, what, a, what a great guy and a great musician, and... Uh, we had a lot of fun playing with him. Let's see who else. Um, Mike Jellick, I've done a lot of stuff with. Uh, really, really big fan of his playing, too. Uh, I had a jazz trio for a while there that was just bass, piano, and vocals with uh, a girl, Dolores Reyes, who's gotten married and is Dolores Aquino now. And um, Bob Mervak, played with him quite a few times with that group. Um, and then some of the other bands I've played with. Uh, I, I when I first kind of started touring with bands and stuff like that, I got picked up with uh, the Atomic Fireballs during the tail end of the swing craze and uh, re swing swing craze, I should say, in the late '90s there. And I toured with the Atomic Fireballs for uh, for a minute there, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I've also toured with uh, Motor City Josh. Uh, then there was an Irish group out of. Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, called the Town Pants. I worked with them for a while. I've uh, uh, and then you know my own projects that I've been working on. And uh, like right now, I'm working with my wife on a group called Rio and the Rockabilly Revival, which is a, an amazing amount of fun for a. a you know, I, I my wife does really good work, and she said, "Hey, we should do rockabilly." And I thought, "Man, that would be cool," but I just don't know that much about it yet. And then we started doing it, and especially with the presence that she brought and uh, and the legitimacy she brought, because her uncle was Jack Scott, who was one of the original guys from back in the 50s that made Rockabilly what it was. And so, you know, she's got stories about, you know, like people like Chuck Berry would come up to her grandmother's house for dinner. That was like no big deal. Dick hmm. Clark, all like... All sorts of people like that, man. And so, uh. it, so it was really interesting getting into this. I'm like, oh my god. And then she's such a great performer that there's uh, a wonderful energy, and that's a lot of fun. So I'm really digging that. Uh, I worked with, let's see, Musique Noir for a little bit there, which was so cool because it was like violin and two violas, two percussionists, guitar and bass, oh. and doing all sorts of like crazy acoustic world fusion stuff. I, I so much fun with that. Um, I played with uh, Gino Finelli uh, in a group called Filter Kings for a little bit there. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and now he's doing like the like Red Hot Sugar Daddies, or uh, I'm not even sure what they're called right now. I also played with him briefly um, in a group called Gypsy Strings. Did you ever have to cover uh, Brother to Brother? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know, you know what song I'm talking about with yeah. uh, Jimmy Haslip yeah. played on that one. Yeah. Yeah, that was some main stuff. Yeah. Wow, Jimmy. man. Oh, that's um, green Jimmy, too. Yeah. Uh, man, wow. Uh, so can we find any of this stuff uh, on your it, it pages? And yeah, yeah. I've got connections to most of the stuff I've done, uh, links to something or another, you know, almost anywhere I am. So if you go to my Facebook or something like that, which is uh, facebook.com slash Sean Eric Harris Music, uh -huh. um, there's stuff there. I've got some videos. If you go to Sean Eric Harris as one of the users on YouTube, there's uh -huh. some videos I've got up there as well. And then with Rockabilly Rio, um, like I said, there's there might be some stuff on the Music Noirs page on YouTube. So, I mean, there's stuff filtering through all over the place. Well, I, I hope people go to find it. And, um, Me too. <laughs> the, the way I found you was... Uh, uh, you know, I was on one of my favorite pages or groups on Facebook. Is this uh, group and page called Detroit Bass Players? Excellent. What, br what, what bring you? What brought you to the to find the Detroit Bass Players page? Well, you know what? I, I saw it and I tried to join the group, and just because I'm like, oh, Detroit Bass Players, that's kind of cool. You know, whatever. And so I joined it. There, you know, I, I fan or like or you know whatever on Facebook, whatever happens to be kind of tickling my fancy that day. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then actually started checking out what was going on with the bass player group. And, and it's great. The Detroit bass player group on there is actually fun. And it's cool. I mean, people are always talking about interesting things. Uh, I get to catch up from all sorts of people that uh, a lot of them I know, but a lot of people I don't know right here in the Detroit area. And most of the time, it's something that I actually care about reading. Whereas in a lot of groups, there's just like stuff that comes through. And you're just like, what? Why, why did I join this group? You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's always some crap on here. I don't need this. But almost everything that comes through the Detroit Bass Player uh, site, I find to be really interesting and uh, and fun. And it's it's cool to hear what everyone else is up to and what they're doing. And it, I really enjoy it. So do I. I, I. I agree. I really agree with that. Yeah. Um... Well, you know what, man? Uh, why don't you uh, have a seat on your on your stool and and pull your other bass out? Cause uh, before you leave us, I want to hear what you got on the um, on the uh, uh, on the fretless. Now we done heard you popping and slapping. We got the fretless. We got that. We got we also. Oh, you got it. You got it. Yeah, I got my, got the fretless. my PVs here too. Oh, and you also have what's that? A five string yeah, five series, two. which is a fine bass. That's about. Mm. 90% of, of my work, if it's not rocket or if it's not something on upright, mm -hmm. about 90% of the time I'm probably playing that. So uh, which one you want to grab and, and uh, deal with? We back with my man, Mr. Eric, Mr. Sean Eric Harris, and he's gonna play us out in a second. But before he plays us out, um, I got a couple of more questions for you, man. Like. Um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about while you're sitting up there tapping and, and playing chords and melodies all at the same time? Uh, well, you know, man, um, uh, I like to, like we talked a little bit about how um, one of the things I find like, like super, super cool and, and really, really fulfilling as a musician is doing different things. Uh, I'm always trying to get into something I haven't done before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when I got, got into the rockabilly thing, now, you know, my preconceptions of rockabilly were wrong. But with, with the sort of simplicity of it, there is a simplicity, but there's there's some serious material to sink your teeth into there. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I find that that's true for anything. If you're playing, you know, polkas, there's an art to a polka, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? It truly and it's is. not just... Oompa, oompa, oompa. I mean, there's that aspect to it, but I mean, there's probably a lot more to it if you pay attention exactly. to it. Exactly. Um, I have, uh, I'm the leader of an Irish band called Brothers of the Sea, and, you know, I find it, it's so cool because, I mean, you know, most of what I do is, you know, uh, you know, man, it was a lass from the lower class, it was an Irish immigrant, she, you know, that kind of stuff, and it's real basic, real straightforward, and fun. But there's a lot of things to really, you know, if you approach it authentically and, and try to to treat it um, with respect. I mean, the people who created this music didn't do it, you know, just messing around. They, they meant it. So no matter what it is, you should approach it like you mean it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then take your other influences. And so like you saw, I was doing, you know, some of the that kind of stuff here. Yeah. I find, you know, the Irish band, I might break into... which is, that's kind of cool too. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, I dig that right there. It's so there. fun, and like a, a, a second ago I was doing, uh, that was Danny Boy. Yeah, old Danny Boy. <laughs> You know, I, I'm, you know, obviously stretching out the harmony a lot, right. and uh, you know, really knowing my theory and, and being able to uh, s 
study a lot of, you know, the extended harmonies and, and the way that you can move through things using, you know, thirteens and all that fun stuff. Um, allows me to play something that's very basic and traditional like that. You know, Danny Boy is just... You know, it's not really that much, I and mean, it's mostly just, you know, a major scale. Most right. of it's actually just a pentatonic. It's not even, you know, the full scale. But, uh... It, breaking it down and analyzing it and reinventing it, you can really do a lot more with it. And that's the kind of stuff you hear people you know, Stanley Clarks and Victor Wooten and all those guys. That's that's part of the beauty of what they do. Is I love analyzing. Oh yeah, man. I me too. I, I, I love the analysis and you know I mean I even get into like arguments with people about thirteenth chords. I mean, come on. <laughs> right. I mean I There's analyze no such thing as a minor thirteenth chord. <laughs> I'll analyze if 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 all they doing is pedaling and E I will analyze that. What What's going on with just that one note? And, and there's a lot that can be going on with just one note. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I remember studying with Stravinsky, which is funny because it reminded me a lot of some of some of these heavy metal kids, like I mentioned Cliff Burton earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and his bass line might be... But I mean, even just the very fact that there's sort of a rhythmic etching there, mm -hmm. which is not totally dissimilar from uh, the Rite of Spring, where they've got, you know, how could I do it here? Um, you know, we, but of course, I mean, they're doing it with like a 152 piece orchestra, but still, the concept is there. I mean, the notes are notes, and how many people play the notes doesn't make any difference. The basic concept is everything there, you know? Now, of course, there's a lot more going on because he's doing, you know, the two dominant chords, a half step away, blah, 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 all that stuff. But, I mean, you know. I mean, something like that would make a pretty cool heavy metal song if you right. wanted to do it that way. See, a lot of people don't know that that half step away dominant chords is really a tritone substitution for the fifth of the fifth. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, or the, or the tritone of the fifth. But but in this case it wasn't because on the coronation of spring it was a half step away from from itself. So what it was was an E uh, dominant chord, uh, you know, like that, next to an E flat dominant chord. <laughs> so I mean it was everything was a half step away from itself, you know, just crying. But the importance wasn't so much the the tension was there because of the chords. And what he did is, you know, half steps create a lot of tension by themselves, you know. There's a lot of tension there in a half step. A tritone causes a lot of tension. A dominant chord causes a lot of tension. Two dominant chords a half step away from each other. That's a lot of tension all at once. And so what he's doing is making, trying to fill up space, make a, a sonic wall there mm -hmm. with that. But then, the important part wasn't so much the sonic wall as the rhythmic etching. He was mm -hmm. creating that tension there and giving it almost like a, a dominant and tonic relation of tension and release rhythmically. Mm -hmm. So rhythmically, you can do a ton with a piece of music. And uh, I mean, I remember my theory class where we were studying Stravinsky. I mean, I learned so much that day <laughs> that you know a lot of that I use to this day. It's, it's very very cool. Well, well, let me ask you this. Um this is a few. It's a few um, instructors, bass instructors on um, uh, coming through the Detroit bass players. I know Lamont Johnson is one. Reggie mm -hmm. Reggie studies under him sometimes. Uh, do okay. you teach bass guitar? I, yeah, sure do. So, so if somebody wanted to take some lessons from you, they can come yeah. through one of the sites you mentioned earlier yeah. and send you a message or call you and all absolutely, of that stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. You can do that. Sure, sure uh, can. All right, folks. Well, you can find uh, me easy enough on Facebook. All right, so there you have it. This is our man, Mr. Sean Eric Harris, getting down, and he's gonna play us out a little something. <laughs> Thank you.